So before we go into the uh, research project, which is, by the way, a joint project with uh, Professor Peter Kuglo, uh, who currently is at the SMB and also the University of Basel, I will talk briefly about tokenization. I will give an intro into virtual worlds. I will show you the approach and the research set up the data generation. And then we finally go into the empirical analysis. Now, tokenization is quite a, a hype uh, topic right now. I mean, I'm sure you have heard about it. And if you have to uh, show tokenization just in a single picture, I think that would be it right here, right? You take assets like real estate, art, um, some, some stocks, bonds, or even fiat currency in the form of a stablecoin, and then you add it to a token, okay? A token being uh, a unit of value, which can be transacted on a blockchain. Now, that's the most basic explanation you will ever get, but uh, I mean, it doesn't do justice to tokenization because there are so many uh, distinguishing factors. One being fungibility, with the basic question, is the token unique or are there multiple instances of the same? For example, when you have a, a, an object of art, then this is really a unique object, right? If you tokenize it, then it's important that you can track this specific token. If you have uh, stocks or bonds, then there are multiple instances of this object, uh, which are represented by so-called fungible tokens. The second one being the counterparty risk. Of course, when you add something like this, to a token and trade on the blockchain, and let's say I promise you an ounce of gold for this token, then this basically is an IOU. And the value really depends on my reputation. If you believe me that I will give you an ounce of gold for this token, then this token will have value. If you don't believe me, then this token won't have value, as simple as that. And the first thing you have to look at really is the consensus protocol, because blockchain is used in so many different projects, some of which hardly resemble the original design of a blockchain and are more mm, in the domain of a centralized database, to be honest. So you have to be really careful when you look at these tokenization projects, where exactly in this domain you are. The second thing is more on the technical side. I mean, there are so many different token standards. Most of the tokens we are currently looking at are in this domain. They are based on smart contracts. But if you have been uh, around for a long time in this space, you, you probably remember the, the term colored coins. Color coins basically was the idea that you take some object of value and you attach it to a fraction of a Bitcoin. And then you say, okay, this, this fraction of a Bitcoin, these few Satoshi, they also represent an ounce of gold and it can be traded. So for the more technical guys here, uh, it's basically attached to a UTXO or to the transaction graph to UTXO. The second one are so-called layer-based models. Uh, maybe you remember Mastercoin or Omni, also counterpart, where you have a separate transaction graph, which basically only adds snapshots to the blockchain. And this can also be used to issue tokens. But by far, the most important way how tokens are issued currently is through smart contracts, where you deploy a smart contract on a blockchain, usually with the ERC-20 token standard on Ethereum, and I will show you the numbers later on. But there are many other standards like 23, um, and they also has NAP5, QRC20 on a quantum blockchain. Well, when you look at the numbers, um, I have another slide in between, but you will see the numbers later on. ERC20 is really dominant. Now, when we go back to the, these three uh, distinguishing factors, characteristics, we have fungibility right here. So on this axis, fungible tokens, non-fungible tokens. We have the consensus protocol right here with permission blockchains, public blockchains. And then we have the counterparty risk on this axis with native tokens that do not have any counterparty risk and straight promises to pay to deliver something on this axis. And the first two examples I'd like to mention, they are both fungible right here. They are both in the public domain, but they differ in terms of the risk one, being Tether, is a stable coin with off-chain collateral. So basically the US dollars are in a bank account and it's just a promise that you can get these dollars against the token. Maker, or also, um, you could also make the example of DAI, which is the stable coin of the Maker project, uh, has on-chain collateral, so there is no counterparty. Yes, you could make the argument that uh, you are at risk that the smart contract is broken. Of course, this could happen, but there is no counterparty uh, that guarantees you to pay out these funds. And when you look at these two types, and I'm not just talking about the stable coins, I'm saying in general, when you talk about fungible, tokens which get created on a public chain, then you come up with these numbers, 
This is a representation of uh, all listed tokens, listed meaning on exchanges, uh, which are currently on public chains. And as you can see, when we take the number of different tokens, <laughs> almost 90% are on the Ethereum blockchain and almost all of them, I mean it's really negligible, um, what is not ERC20, almost all of them are ERC20 tokens. When you look at market cap, uh, it's almost the same, it is slightly different but it's just different because of one project and that that is Tether, uh, Tether which uh, uses to some degree the Omni protocol and you can see uh, there are 20% uh, of market cap are uh, because of Tether on Omni, yes. Sure, yeah. Uh, do we have, um, can I upload it somewhere? Or? Yeah, you can send it to me. Perfect, all right. But that's of course just the public chains, right? So, I mean, we can take another point right here and I call it permissioned exchange assets. As you can see, I'm talking about fungible projects. Uh, they have a counterparty risk and they are on a permissioned chain. And, you know, I could have written STX, but I was kind of scared, so I just call it a permissioned exchange assets, but that's basically what it is, right? And the last one, and that's in blue, because I am going to talk about these kind of tokens, are public, native, non-fungible tokens, which is a really complicated term for saying crypto kitties. And of course, it's not just CryptoKitties. I'm sure you know these cats, right? How many of you uh, are familiar with CryptoKitties? I mean, these cats have been all over the media. For those of you who are not familiar with it, it's basically uh, images of cats that are represented by a non-fungible token, and you can buy these images. And this doesn't sound like the most exciting thing, but what is really exciting about it is it is the first time where you can prove in a decentralized way that you are the sole owner of these digital cats or of this digital, these digital assets, uh, whatever. I mean, there are other examples, CryptoPunks, for example, they even have been at Art Basel. That, that's art, at least that's what, that's what they tell me. <laughs> it's pixel art. And people, I mean, for the, for the cats, as an example, the most expensive crypto kitty has been sold for over 100,000 US dollars. Yes. And with the punks, I don't know the actual prices for the punks, but I know that most of them go in between 10 and 100 US dollars. That's around the price range. Even the Major League Baseball, so the American Baseball League, they have issued tokens which are equivalent to baseball cards, but you can buy these players as a crypto token. There are games, uh, like uh, maybe you're familiar with Magic the Gathering. Uh, that's, that's, this project is called Gods Unchained. It's basically a collectible card game on the blockchain. And of course, one of the most exciting projects uh, in the non-fungible um, uh, token space is the ENS, Ethereum name service, where you can buy Ethereum domains, .eth. And what is really exciting about this project is usually when you have a domain, let's say you have google.com, and uh, you type it in in your browser, then in the background you're going to a server, and this server maps whatever you have entered with an IP address. And one well-known attack in computer science is when you just exchange this directory. So when somebody types in google.com, they get a different IP address. <laughs> they land on a completely different page, but they still believe they're on google.com. And this is really dangerous. And ENS manages this mapping, usually for, for crypto addresses, but it would also be possible for domains with a smart contract. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, I'd like to move that question to the upper if that's fine with you, because that will take mm, way too long. <laughs> All right. And one of the most exciting projects, and that's where we go full circle in the NFT space, is Decentraland. And Decentraland uh, really is a virtual world where you can buy property in this virtual world, and this property is represented as a token. Now, before we go into Decentraland, I'd like to give you a quick intro on virtual worlds. And maybe you're familiar with Second Life. Um, I mean, it's quite an old project and uh, it is heavily centralized, but it's interesting because you had the chance to walk around with your avatar in this world. You could buy islands, uh, property, companies like IBM, they had virtual meetings in this world. There have been educational institutions in this world. So it's really, it is a big thing. 
But there is one problem with Second Life. And the problem is it has a heavily centralized architecture. There is one company in the middle, it's called Linden Labs. And, you know, I might give you some examples. For example, um, they could sh simply shut down the servers if, if it's not profitable, profitable for them anymore, even if you have invested hundreds of thousands of Swiss francs in property, if they don't want to um, resume the service, they can simply shut it down. There could be some issues with server maintenance where the project simply uh, doesn't work anymore and you cannot sell your pro uh, products anymore. There has been an incident in 2007. In Second Life there have been many casinos <laughs> and it was quite a lucrative business. But then suddenly they changed the rules and said, nah, no gambling anymore. So of course these people who bought the property for these reasons had to shut down their businesses. Yeah, and I just mentioned that when Linton Lab shuts down the service, everything will be gone. So you basically lose everything. And that leads to the question, could we come up with a similar project when virtual worlds uh, might become more and more important with the emergence of virtual reality, where we have a more decentralized design, where we're not relying, where we're not dependent on a single company. And that's basically um, Decentraland. So I know you have heard about smart contracts. Still, I want to give you some background because I... Uh, heavily dislike the term smart contract. Uh, I think it is misleading because it's neither smart nor a contract. What I like to think of is a simple vending machine. And this actually goes back to Nick Zabo's original 1994 paper. And even if you have no background in coding whatsoever, please follow along because it's really simple, okay? Just give me a chance, look into the code. Because that's basically the code for a vending machine. If the coin you're putting in there is larger equal to the price then you're going with the function dispense beverage so basically uh, uh, give me the coke and followed by the function return change which is just the difference between coin and price as simple as that if you haven't inserted in a sufficient amount of coin which is represented by else then the vending machine simply prints insufficient funds, and that's it. That's the, the well, it's, it's basic, but it's the most basic code you need for a vending machine. Now, this vending machine has one huge problem, actually two. The first one is the code is not open source. So when you're going to a vending machine, you're putting coins in there, you just assume that you get your Coke, but you don't really know because you never saw the code, right? And the second one, you don't know the execution environment. It is controlled by the vendor. You don't know the hardware. It could be heavily manipulated. And if you think about smart contract, these two problems are exactly the problem smart contracts solve. Smart contracts are really inefficient. <laughs> they are, for, for most automation projects, they are not well suited. They're, I mean, probably not the favorite choice for most projects, but they solve these two issues because you see the code, and you have a controlled execution environment. And that's it. That's basically the smart contract. As I said, it's going back to the 1994 paper of Nick Sample. Um, the execution environment is the uh, uh, Ethereum uh, yellow paper, uh, Gavin Wood and uh, Vitalik Buterin. And I don't want to spend too much time on this graph, but just to give you some impression, basically a user issues a transaction, sends it to the uh, smart contract address. Um, as you have some information in their payload where you can trigger a function uh, or also a method, then the data is stored on chain. You can also use the on chain data as input, and everything gets executed on the so called EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine, which is just a complicated word for many computers, okay? And the last thing you need to know, I mean, we don't need that in this particular instance, but for many applications, you need so-called oracles. Whenever you have some outside data, you want to use, let's say, uh, football scores or weather data or just something that is not natively available on the blockchain, you need some trusted source of information. That's what we call oracles. But you can forget about the oracles for this case. We don't need them. All right. And when we look at the central end, the architecture, I mean, there is the, the really bottom layer, it's called the ownership layer, is implemented through such a smart contract. And basically what it is, it's just the tokens for the property and also a reference to anything you want to add to your land. The actual objects, so let's say a house or trees or whatever you want to build on your land, are stored on IPFS. So you have a reference in the contract um, for the technical guys in here. It's the hash value that points on the IPFS 
uh, packages. And then the last layer is the visualization layer. Uh, it's basically your client that visualizes everything. So you, you need some application, of course, when you're walking around with your virtual reality goggles uh, that paints a picture of, of these elements, right? And that's the visualization layer. And that's basically the, the uh, architecture you need. So now about a decentral end. Each parcel you can buy has a total sum of 100 square meters. It's 10 by 10, 10. And in total, there are 90,601 parcels. It's a virtual world. I mentioned that it's implemented on smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. But for economists, that's where it gets interesting because back in December 2017, there has been an initial auction through the smart contract. You were able to bid on these individual parcels. And due to the openness of the smart contract, due to the characteristics of the Ethereum blockchain, we were able to get all the transactions, see exactly what people have been willing to pay for individual parcels, which created an amazing data set. And in total, 12.5 million US dollars have been spent in this initial auction. I, I know that this looks really weird, right? If I say approximately 1,641 owners, but that's not a typo. I wanted to do that for the simple reason because there is no one-to-one -one mapping, right? I mean, we are observing addresses, but there are good reasons why one address could represent multiple people and the other way around. Uh, that's why I have the approximately there, all right. The two research questions I'd like to tackle is first, what determines the price of parcels in a virtual world? And the second one, are there any similarities to the real physical world? And just one point I like to stress again because I always get this question after this talk, is this not an actual place, right? We're not talking about a physical location. It's really a virtual world which has nothing to do with the physical world. So this is basically a, a virtual game world, okay? Let's go with the research setup. The first thing uh, uh, we did is, of course, getting the data from the smart contract in a structured form. Then we had to run some computations, and you will say later on, see later on that this is, uh, was quite complicated to create the first data set, uh, as we are aware of, for virtual property. And then we perform an econometric or empirical analysis. Again, I, I mentioned that 12.5 million US dollars. And uh, I mean, the idea behind this study is that we believe, we truly believe that virtual real estate, this virtual world, will become more and more important. What we got from the smart contract um, is, of course, the X value, the Y value. So when you think of this world as a, a coordinate system, it's, it's the location of these parcels. We also got the final auction price. We got the district ID, and I will show you later on what that is. And of course, the owner address, so we know exactly uh, which address bought these parcels. And we've been really exciting. I mean, there was a lot of work to, to get this data and prepare it. And in a way, that's what decentralized looks like. I mean, when you, when you plot the districts, when you plot the streets, when you plot the uh, plazas, that's basically the outline of decentralized. So the purple color represents districts. These parcels have not been sold during the auction. These are things like a, a red light district or a university district. I mean, uh, you will see some examples later on. Uh, the lighter gray uh, are plazas. They also have not been for sale. These are really public areas where you can walk around. And so are the uh, darker gray. Th this is, these are streets. These are also public areas, okay? Now, the streets, they are not that important because you can teleport around, of course. But if you're thinking in terms of commerce, where you just stumble in some, some, some uh, commerce location, right, then it's a reasonable assumption that people walk down streets and they might, may uh, find a new store uh, instead of just uh, trying to lock and uh, enter some random uh, cordon. Okay, and that is when you visualize the prices. I mean, the black ones, they have been unsold. Um, because there's been a minimum price of 100 US dollars. The green ones, they went from the minimum price uh, for 100 US dollars and it goes all the way up to, I, I think the most expensive one was around 70,000 US dollars. And if I, if I recall correctly, it is uh, uh, this one right here. So right the corner right here. <laughs> and you can already see, I mean, there is some correlation um, between the center of proximity and price. I'm not saying it's causality yet, but uh, there surely, surely is some correlation, okay? 
Now, the next thing we wanted to do is we looked at some real-world studies, and I'm not going through them right now, but these are basically studies that look at price building in the real physical world, and they come up with uh, price determinants of proximity to centum. So the closer you are to a city center, the more expensive your property usually is. Proximity to landmarks, which are parks, plazas, shopping areas, all these different things. The connection to public transport and travel connections, which is also really important. The building characteristics, uh, so basically, um, do you have a really old building or one that has the, the nicest and best standards? And then the risk profile, so natural disasters. And you, we can safely exclude the last two because you can build whatever you want in the central land, and uh, at least I'm not aware of any natural disasters in this world. So uh, I think we can say in the virtual world these are not actual price determinants. Um, you will see about that. I mean, there is no public transportation, you're absolutely right, but um, we thought that streets might be a good proxy for that. Yeah. Okay, so the next thing we did was the data generation. And we went with the first hypothesis. And the first hypothesis simply is agents prefer parcels that are closer to the center of the map, okay? Now, when you want to calculate that, <laughs> it's a simple Pythagoras. Um, I mean, it's not that complicated. Uh, and that's what we did. So we just took the, uh, um, the the center parcel and calculated the distance to it. And uh, basically, when you when you plot that against prices, so we have prices on, in US dollars on the y-axis, and the distance to the center on the x-axis. And uh, don't get confused. That's the exact same plot twice with a different zoom level. Okay. Here you, are, so here you are in between 0 and 200, and here in between 0 and 45. It's just that you can uh, have a better look at it. You already see that there might be some correlation. Again, I'm not saying it's causality. We will see about that, but there is some correlation for sure. The second thing we did is, I mean, there are, um, there is not just a center plaza, there are additional plazas in this world, right? Um, I mean, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Nine plazas. And uh, we looked for the closest one, so we just took the minimum distance to any of the plazas and uh, also have been looking for that variable. And again, I mean, it's, it's much harder to tell, but with uh, some fantasy you can still say that there might be some kind of correlation in this data, okay? And the next one turned out to be really complicated, and that's the streets. It's the hypothesis that agents prefer parcels that are closer to streets. And that really goes back to your question, right? It's our proxy for public transport. And we had two issues with that. The first one was how to identify streets, which wasn't that easy if you have no documentation. And the second one was how to compute the closest distance efficiently. Now, the first one, we just had to look through the smart contract, and it turns out that this here uh, means uh, a street in the central and talk, okay? That's some, just something you had to find out because there wasn't any documentation in that. The second one was we had to find out uh, an efficient algorithm uh, to compute the closest distance. And the first one we tried was simply an exhaustive search. So go over every single of these parcels, um, ask the question, are you a street? And then how far away are you from the par parcel we're currently looking at? Now it turned out with this algorithm, even with reasonable computational power, it would have taken several years <laughs> to compute all these variables, which is probably a bad idea. So we had to go for something more efficient, and what we did was a proximity search algorithm, so we just took uh, uh, one of these parcels, and then we circled around it, asked any one of these parcels, are you a street? And if any one of them turned out to be a street, and second condition, if the next circle couldn't deliver a closer distance, we just stopped right there, okay? Well, that was just a much more efficient way to go. And I remember that it was right before Basel of Osnacht, and uh, I'm from Basel, and it's a really big deal in Basel, of course. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know, Basel of Osnacht go, uh, goes on for three days, okay? So I started the computers, and it was, it was a great setup with, uh, I think it was seven computers, and I know that this looks really nerdy, that's because it is, but I'm proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> And I went to Fasnacht, we had a great time, uh, I came back and it was done, okay? I was really happy because uh, with the initial setup it would have t uh, taken several years. With this setup uh, we have been done within three days and had a good time at Fasnacht. 
So again here, um, you can assume some correlation, but again, it's not as, as uh, uh, straightforward as with the uh, distance to the center. The next hypothesis is uh, some districts have a significant price effect on adjacent parcels. And I have to tell you that the central end has 56 districts. And there are, uh, I mean, the, the largest one is the uh, Ethereum uh, project with uh, a size of 8,000 approximately uh, parcels. The smallest one is Little India uh, with uh, just five parcels. And uh, I mean, there are many districts in between, including Fashion Street, Dragon City, the Red Light District, also the University District. And uh, it was before the auction where you could allocate some funds to these districts and they basically bought the parcels. So it was built by a community, okay? But these parcels have been excluded during the auction. So before the auction even started, these districts have been set in place. Now the hypothesis is that parcels, individual parcels, which are adjacent to some of these districts, may score a significantly higher or lower price than comparable parcels, okay? So I've been looking at the uh, parcels which are adjacent to any one of these districts individually and uh, looked at the price uh, significance, uh, the effects. And five districts we couldn't have a look at uh, for the simple reason that they are embedded within other districts and obviously then there aren't any adjacent parcels for sale right, when they're embedded in another district. So that's just a side note. Okay, I will come back to that. And the last hypothesis was the idea that people have a higher willingness to pay for parcels when they already have, when they already own a parcel adjacent to it. So basically the idea that people prefer large areas, that they want to buy large clusters. And we came up with two different measures. The first one, the neighbor score, uh, simply counts the parcels surrounding this one parcel we're looking at. And for example, here we're looking at this parcel. It turns out that the same person or the same address owns one additional parcel. This would lead to a neighborhood score of one. In this case, the same person controls three of the adjacent parcels, which leads to a neighborhood score of three. But we also went with a second measure. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's straightforward. The first one is in between as an element of zero to eight. And the second one is just a dummy. It's a neighbor dummy. Dummy simply means that it's a variable which can only assume the value is zero or one. And it is zero if the neighbor score is zero and it is one otherwise. Meaning then, as soon as you have at least one of the adjacent parcels that is controlled by the same person, you will have a neighbor dummy of one. Otherwise, when it's not surrounded by any parcels that are controlled by the same person, it will be zero, okay? All right, now that was the data generation. Now let's go with the empirical analysis and run some regression models. And don't get scared. I mean, uh, I will guide you through that. That's just the regression output. Depen the dependent variable is just log price, and that's the model. Uh, you can ignore the intercept. Uh, here, that's log cento, so that's the proximity. Log plaza is the distance to the plazas. Log street is the distance to the streets. Uh, neighbor dummy and neighbor square I just explained, and these are the most significant. Out of these 56 districts, these are the most significant ones. So. I mean, standard error, forget about it. P-value is really important. Uh, P-value of 0. 0.0000 simply means it is highly significant, okay? It means these effects, these effects are highly important. Now, when we have a negative sign right here with uh, log cento, what does it mean? It means when the distance from the center increases, when this variable gets larger, then the price will likely decrease. And since it is log log, it means that when we increase the distance from Cento by 1%, then the price will likely, as must described by the model, decrease by 0.69 or almost 0.7%, okay? That's the interpretation. With log plaza, that is really surprising because our hypothesis was, of course, the further away you get from the plazas, the less expensive the parcel turns out to be, right? But as you can see here, it is a positive uh, coefficient. And the interpretation would be that the further away you get from the blouses, the more expensive it gets. Now, um, we run some other regression models and this uh, effect is not sustainable. It changes later on. 
so when we control for other models, um, uh, it changes, meaning that this interpretation is probably uh, not the best one. With the street, the, the log street, uh, as our hypothesis also, uh, when you change the distance, when you increase the distance from a street by 1%, then you will get 0.2% lower prices compared to uh, comparable parcels. And then again here, a big surprise, because the hypothesis was that people prefer clusters, people want to have um, um, a cluster of similar parcels right next to each other, right? But again, we get a negative coefficient, meaning that there is actually a significant negative price impact when you already own one, one parcel right next to it, which is also surprising. Now, the highlights. The first one, uh, Crypto Valley. It turns out with Crypto Valley, I'm, I'm not telling you how you calculate that. I mean, you can look it up. It's a log-log model. But basically, what these 2.64 mean is that parcels which are adjacent to Crypto Valley <laughs> turn out to be 14 times more expensive than comparable parcels which are not adjacent to Crypto Valley, okay? With the red light district, if you happen to have a parcel that is right next to the red light district, on average it's 7.75 times more expensive than a comparable parcel which is not right next to the red light district. Um, I'd assume in the physical world it's the opposite because uh, I've never heard, hey, it's great, I want a parcel right next to the red light district because it's great to live there, right? Uh, I, I think one interpretation of this phenomenon is uh, that this is a great business opportunity, right, in the internet. And that will be one of the main conclusions of this talk, sex sells in the internet, and we can see that right here. A uh, similar interpretation with con the district for cannabis connoisseurs, uh, <laughs> which has a, a 7.6 times higher price, and the only district with a negative, with a significant negative impact in the entire data set <laughs> was Anarchy International. So it then turns out when you have a parcel that is right next to the anarchist district, uh, you have a, a negative 26% price impact on your parcel. All right, for the statisticians right here, uh, then we have an adjusted R square of 0.35, and this is the number of observations. Now let's look at some of these districts uh, a little closer. That, that right here is Crypto Valley. Uh, that's the size in square meters, and we have an APPA, that's an adjacent parcel price average of 4,112 US dollars, meaning on average when you bought a parcel right next to this district, you spent that much money. That's the red light district right here, a really large one, uh, with an APPA of 2,000 uh, US dollars, it's 200,000 square meters large. A resort for cannabis connoisseurs, it's really small, it's um, right here, you can barely see it. It has a really high APPA. And I, you know, uh, one thing that really puzzles me, maybe you can explain me, I, I, I might just not get it, but uh, I mean, a resource for cannabis connoisseurs and they claim they want a, a virtually smoke pot. I really don't know what exactly they're doing there. I, I don't get it. I assume maybe it's a place where you can sell cannabis, but virtually smoking pot, uh, I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't get it. <laughs> Most likely. <laughs> and then, of course, Anarchist International, the one I've been telling you about right here, that's the only one with a significant price impact, a significant negative price impact. Uh, and I, I, want to, I want to read the description. Just really quick description, and then we go question. This district is a refuge for anarchists to gather outside the statist corporate systems they are battling against. For the liberation of humankind, this district will be a clusterfuck of chaotic development stacked on top of other clusterfucks of development with, with occasional large-scale planned cooperative achievements. Okay, so basically meaning we're never cooperating, except for on some occasions we might, but I... I uh, now, yeah, question, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, you might be absolutely right about that. And in fact, I have a second regression model in there which will uh, show that you are exactly right. I think the reason behind that is mainly that we have um, when you're moving further away from one plaza, you usually go in closer to the next one, right? <laughs> and that might be, I mean, that might be also uh, a source of these, these hiccups. 
Now, neighbor score. Remember the cluster premium we have been talking about? Now, this has been really puzzling to us because I still believe that people prefer to have a larger cluster, a larger area, right? So the first thing we did was plotting every parcel that has a neighbor score of one or above. Meaning that for all these parcels you see right here in blue, there is at least an adjacent parcel owned by the same person or the same address. <laughs> so basically everything is blue. <laughs> Meaning that when you have an auction and people start by default buying uh, bidding for parcels which are close, uh, in, uh, which are right next to each other, and then somebody else came in and bid for one of these parcels, then obviously it turns out you have a higher price. Okay. So one interpretation would be that people actually messed it up by stepping in there, paying a higher price for it, and that's what we observe in the data. Whenever there's somebody else, then of course it's not owned by, uh, by the same guy, and you also observe a higher price. That would be one interpretation. Now, really interesting, a neighbor score of 8, remember, means that everything surrounding that parcel is owned by the same address. <laughs> so when you look at that, that means that one guy bought this entire area right here. Another guy bought this entire area right here, which led to the question, how much money are people willing to spend in this virtual world? And we have prepared a top five for you. <laughs> Ranked fifth. We have this guy who bought 1,131 parcels for 126,000 US dollars. And in first place, we have um, one guy who bought 1,217 parcels for 150,000 US dollars. Then we have one guy who spent almost 300,000 US dollars, a guy who spent more than half a million US dollars, and this guy we've just observed right here in the middle who happens to control uh, um, a huge chunk of the um, really uh, great location property spent 665,000 US dollars on virtual property. Now when you add up the top five, they control 22.4% of the parcels sold, and they uh, have spent 14.14% of the total spendings of these 12.5 uh, million US dollars. Okay, I'm not going into technical details right here, but basically what we did is we went, uh, you know, in a number of, uh, of uh, additional regression models, and in this specific one we allowed for breaks. So we said, what if the determinants for the most expensive parcels are different uh, than for the, the less expensive ones, okay? And mm, basically, you, we, we have allowed in this model uh, a maximum of five breaks. Uh, trimming is just a minimum value, so at least 15% have to be in these intervals, and that's the significance level. And the model came up with three breaks, so it didn't take the maximum, which is a good thing. And when you, when you look at the model again, uh, you can completely ignore this part, then it turns out that for the most expensive one, the uh, plaza, as you have suggested, the plaza proximity uh, becomes, as we have, might have expected, also negative. So for the most expensive ones, the further away you move from the plazas, the more expensive they get, okay? And also the other ones, um, the, the center uh, remains negative, the, the log street uh, remains negative, the districts become less significant, the effect get a low, lower. For example, Crypto Valley uh, has just a four times multiplicator, which is still a lot if it's four times more expensive than a comparable other parcel, but um, uh, it's smaller than before. And the rest lead light district uh, is 2.1 times the price of a comparable parcel, but it also in the same direction. Uh, the last one, which also becomes significant with this model, is Fluffy DC, which is basically the cat district of Decentraland. Uh, so the, I, I don't know what exactly they are doing, they just describe themselves as the Fluffy Cat District, where everything is cat-based, so I, I, I cannot really tell you what they're doing. Are you the rest of the districts Yes, yeah, everything else has been not significant against the 5% significance interval. Yeah. All right. So again, this is not a really a summary, what I'm about to show you. The summary would be sex cells. Again, the interpretation is um, most likely um, some gray area projects uh, may be well suited to a, a decentralized world. Um, I mean, personally, I think it's great that we have a, a place 
uh, where we can try these, where we can try different things. But I also think it is somewhat dangerous because no matter where you are in your political spectrum, for every individual, there is some threshold value where it's not acceptable anymore, right? At the end of the day, it's really a trade-off between censorship, censorship resistance and running at dangers of having really bad stuff in this world. I mean, I don't want to go with too many examples, but uh, to, to use just one, what about a giant swastika on Main Street? Most people would probably not agree with that, right? So, and uh, I mean, to go full circle, that's why I uh, highly value the work Decentrum is doing because they're exactly tackling these questions. I mean, there are so many philosophical questions, so many political questions in this direction, questions that need to be answered and uh, that highly depend on your political preferences, but also on where we want to go as a society. And that's basically the conclusion. Now, before I stop, I will show you uh, something. And that's the curious behavior. We cannot uh, come up with any interpretation in terms of economics. Uh, we, uh, some people, uh, I mean, they probably have too much money, or I don't know what they did, but they started coloring or drawing things in this world by buying parcels. You know, when you, when you look for individuals and you find out that some of them bought stickmans, or uh, it's kind of weird. So when you look at these examples, uh, the blue stickman, the person who bought this blue stickman in parcels, was willing to pay 7,000 US dollars just to draw this, this little stick man on the map, which is crazy. And when you look at the red parcels, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a vine right here. I don't, I don't know, maybe it's a ladder or whatever it is. And also this person copied the stick man <laughs> and added a ball and uh, <laughs> was willing to pay 12,000 uh, 700 just for the red stick man and the ball and 20,000 for the twine. So yeah, I, I don't know how to explain that, but I hope you enjoyed the talk and I'm looking forward to your questions and to talk to you during the uproar. Thank you very much. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. They're currently running a contest where you can design games. Uh, they also have a prize pool, uh, games specifically suited for Decentraland. And also, I mean, they have the usual open source project. Everything is open source, so you can contribute to the, the, the source code. You can write improvement proposals. Uh, I also wrote an improvement proposal, by the way, because they completely messed up the first auction. Uh, they thought it's a good idea to go with an English auction, and whenever somebody bids, uh, then uh, you know duration increases by an entire day. <laughs> and of course, you know what happens: uh, the auction never ended. So uh, I wrote the improvement proposal, recommended a Dutch auction. Uh, with a commit and reveal scheme um, to, to prevent certain attacks and they actually uh, implemented that for the second auction. I can highly recommend contributing to this project. These are really nice guys. Uh, I should definitely do that. I mean the first thing I have to mention, it's not running right now, right? I mean, this, this entire auction, it has been before the project has been implemented and also it's still uh, not up and live. Um, to reply to your question, um, I think Ethereum isn't necessarily the problem because you're not writing on Ethereum, basically just reading the data, right? And when you're having, when you're having a full note, then that shouldn't be a big issue. Uh, I'm not sure about IPFS because I, I cannot say uh, anything about the performance of IPFS. I simply don't know. The physics in, term of th in terms of the game. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I assume, and also that's something you could uh, go to the governance model, you can uh, implement your own rules in the smart contract, but then again, I mean, you cannot really enforce these rules, right? Because somebody could simply program an, uh, another visualization 
uh, layer, another cl another client, and go with different with different rule set. I think what's really important is that all the rules which have economic implications, meaning that there is a change of ownership uh, when you go with gambling or whatever, they have to be enforced uh, via the smart contract. But when you're talking about actual physics, uh, walking around, uh, I think you will probably have a hard time enforcing that. I mean, honestly, since we recently don't have this application, since it's not up and running, I would now make the argument that all of it is uh, speculation. <laughs> I mean, I was trying to explain uh, what are the motivational drivers behind the speculation, but uh, I mean, there is no cash flow, there is no fundamental value, there is so. But that's not a bad thing. I mean, in economics, a bubble isn't necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. No, as I said, I think everything is just driven by future expectations. Uh, I think it's probably the safest rule you can go with is uh, don't put any money in there. You're not willing. No, 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 no. no. I wasn't finished there. Okay. <laughs> you're you're not willing to lose. Okay. I mean, uh, basically, yes, it m may turn out to be a great project, but it's a, a high risk investment for sure. <laughs> Okay, so basically the question is what are we currently working on? And uh, I can tell you, I mean, something we're currently looking into is the second auction because the, the black spots you, you've seen on there, these parcels had not been sold during the initial auction. Then they have implemented the marketplace uh, uh, where you can resell your parcels. We're also looking into that. And the last thing we're currently looking at is um, we have timestamps uh, for all of these transactions. And uh, in our first uh, relatively naive approach, in our first model, we just took an average price uh, for mana, which happens to be the cryptocurrency. Uh, it's an ERC-20 token on Ethereum uh, with which all these parcels have been uh, paid. And it has been a duration of, uh, I don't know, a few weeks. Uh, so we also want to go into um, um, uh, more precise calculations with the actual dollar value. So these are the next steps. And then one more thing that's on the horizon, uh, we're currently looking into a Shiny application, uh, Shiny, which is just a web front end for R, where you can play around with the data and uh, enter an address, enter several addresses, uh, look at it from different perspectives. So these are the current plans we have. That was a basically a company. That was a team. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, they want to make money. Uh, me being an economist, I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, but the difference, again, between uh, the central and the second life is even if this company isn't around anymore, even if they completely disappear, this world will still exist. And I think that's the crucial difference. Yep. Uh, say it again. Yeah. No, you don't. You can sell services, basically. I mean, you, you don't need a home, right? So uh, it's purely driven by uh, uh, commercial business opportunities, I'd say. Uh, so maybe advertisements, maybe gambling, maybe pornography, uh, you call it.
even more pornography, more casinos. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, <laughs> a larger area, uh, or you could resell it. Uh, speculation. I don't know. I mean, and I only own two parcels, so you don't have to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I don't have a good answer to that question because I mean it's completely decentralized and even if we totally agree that it's a good opportunity, uh, you can probably not stop it. The only thing I can say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean the only thing I can say it's really easy as long as you're stay staying in the ecosystem. When you're trying to go back to the uh, traditional financial system, uh, they of course have their AML requirements and you have to show where the money came from and then you probably have a harder time washing your money with Decentraland than you have through a regular art market or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, all the way back there. Could you speak uh, up a little bit? I can't hear you. No, they don't. It's completely decentralized, uh, no KYC whatsoever. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this relates to your question again, right? Yes, yeah. No, but that's the idea. I mean, that's a design choice, and also you cannot stop it, which is, uh, even if we completely agree that it's a bad idea for whatever reasons, with this architecture, you can simply not stop it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just through a hash value, yeah. yeah. Because otherwise, w I mean, you cannot store uh, store uh, large amounts of data. But this is already uh, implemented in any asset that you that you uh, build your own. Yeah, I mean, that's that's not the complicated part, right? The visualization and the the, the visualization client uh, layer, the client is much more complicated than that. Basically, it's just a smart contract where you can store some hash values in there, and uh, that's straightforward. Great. Right. Case. Thank you very much. It's been a great honor to have uh, Fabian here, one of the leading researchers, one of the leading experts in this field. If you want to read more into his research, um, his book just got translated into English and will be uh, published by MIT Press. So yeah, in one year, because that's how long it takes them, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is a German word. Professor Philip Sandner from Frankfurt. Thank you very much for coming. Yes, ma'am. Thank you.